نتعليم جمونا تيرا با نتعليم Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Jaya Radha Madhava Kundabhyari Jaya Radha Madhava Kundabhyari Shri Shri Radha Madhava Ki Jai Granth Raj Shri Madh Bhagavatam Ki Jai Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasvatim Vyasa Tato Jaya Mudhirayet Before reading from the Srimad Bhagavatam, one should offer respectful obeisances to Nara Narayana Rishi, the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the highest human being, Sarasvati, the Goddess of Learning, and Vyasadev, the compiler of this scripture. So we are reading today from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 4, the Summum Bonum, Chapter 9, <coughs> Dhruva Maharaj Returns Home, Text 4. No? 4? Okay. So please repeat word by word first. Sam Tang Vivakshantam Atat Vidham Harir Nyatvasya Sarvasya Cham Hridi Avastitaha Kritanjalim Brahmama Brahma Mayenam Kambunam Pasparsham Balang Kripayam Kapolem Satvam Vikshantam Atat Vidam Harir Nyat Vasya Sarvasya Chahridi Avastitaham Kritan Jalim Brahma Mayena Kambunam Pasparsha Balam Kripayaka Polem Satvam Vivakshantam Atat Vidam Harir Nyat Vasya Sarvasya Chahridi Avastitaham 
क्रीतंजलिम ब्रह्मयेन कंबुना पश्पाशबालम कृपा यकापुले सत्वम विश्वक्षंतम अतद्विदम हरिर न्यत्वस्य सर्वस्य चाहरिदि अवस्थितहाम कृतंजलिम ब्रह्ममयेन कंबुनाम पश्पाशबालम कृपा यकापुले Somebody else? Ladies? Satam Vishvakshantam Atadvidam Harir Nyadvasya Sarvasya Chahridya Vastitaha Kritan Jalim Brahma Mayena Kambuna Pasparsha Balam Kripaya Kapole Thank you very much. Word by word, please repeat. Saham, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Tam Dhruva, so Dhruva Maharaj. Vishvakshantam, wanting to offer prayers, describing his qualities. Atadvidam, not experienced at that. Harihi, the personality of Godhead. Nyadva, having understood. Asya, of Dhruva Maharaj. Sarvasya, of everyone. Cha, and. Ridi, in the heart. Avastitaha, being situated. Krita Anjalim, situated with folded hands. Brahma Mayena, just consistent with the words of the Vedic hymns. Kambuna, with his conchal. Pasparsha, Touched. Balam. The boy. Kripaya. Out of costless mercy. Kapole. On the forehead. Translation on purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Although Dhruva Maharaj was a small boy, he wanted to offer prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in suitable language, but because he was inexperienced, he could not adjust himself immediately. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, being situated in everyone's heart, could understand Dhruva Maharaja's awkward position. Out of his costless mercy, he touched his conchal to the forehead of Dhruva Maharaj, who stood before him with folded hands. <coughs> um, sorry. Not yet, first purport. <laughs> Every devotee wants to chant the transcendental qualities of the Lord. Devotees are always interested in hearing about the Lord's transcendental qualities, and they are always eager to glorify these qualities. But sometimes they feel uncon inconvenienced by humbleness. The personality of Godhead being situated in everyone's heart specifically gives the devotee intelligence to describe him. 
It is therefore understood that when a devotee writes or speaks about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, his words are dictated by the Lord from within. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita 10th chapter. To those who constantly engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord, the Lord from within dictates what to do next in order to serve Him. When Dhruva Maharaj felt hesitant, not knowing how to describe the Lord for want of sufficient experience, the Lord, out of His causeless mercy, touched His, touched his conch shell to Dhruva's forehead, and He was transcendentally inspired. His transcendental inspiration is called Brahma Maya. This transcendental inspiration is called Brahma Maya because when one is thus inspired, the sound he produces exactly corresponds to the sound vibration of the Vedas. This is not the ordinary sound vibration of this material world. Therefore, the sound vibration of the Hare Krishna mantra, although presented in the ordinary alphabet, should not be taken as mundane or material. Om Hagyana Timirandasya Ginangyana Shalakaya Chakshurum Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Parakamalam Shri Gurum Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakam Vitam Scha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopipakanta Radha Kanta Namostate Jayatam Surato Pangor Mamamanda Matirgati Matsarvasva Padambojo Radha Madana Mohanao Diviat Vrindaranya Kalpadru Mada Shri Madra Tangara Simhasanasto Shri Madrada Shri Lagovinda Deva Upreshtalibi Sevamanao Smarami Shri Manra Sarasaram Vi Vamsivata Tatastitaha Karsham Veno Svanar Gopir Gopinata Shri Estunaha Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishavano Sutta Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Garadhara Shivasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare <coughs> Once again the verse Satam Vik Satam Vivakshantam Atad Vidam Harir Gnatvasya Sarvasya Chahridi Avastitaha Kritan Jalim Brahmamayena Kambuna Pasparshavalam Kripaya Kapole Although Dhruva Maharaj was a small boy, he wanted to offer prayers to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in suitable language, but because he was inexperienced, he could not adjust himself immediately. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, being situated in everyone's heart, could understand Dhruva Maharaj's awkward position. Out of his causeless mercy, he touched his conchal to the forehead of Dhruva Maharaj, who stood before him with folded hands. Hare Krishna. So this is maybe in this Leela, in this pastime, um, one of the most important sections, very, very nice section, um, because we are hearing about Dhruva Maharaj. So Dhruva Maharaj is a small boy, only maybe around five years old, and he um, escaped home. So the previous chapter was Dhruva Maharaj leaves home, and this chapter is now Dhruva Maharaj returns home. So what happened in between, that's the topic of the story. <laughs> so what happened after he left home and before he returned home? Um, Dhruva Maharaj left home because his father was very unfairly discriminating against him. <coughs> um, Dhruva Maharaj's uh, father was Maharaj Uttanapada. And uh, when small Dhruva wanted to climb on his father's lap, um, his stepmother, 
uh, chastised him very heavily, very unfairly. She said, before you can climb on the throne and on the lap of your father, you have to be born through my womb. <laughs> before that, you, couldn't, you cannot. And the father did not protect him. He was you know, under the control of his second wife. So um, Druva felt very awkward, of course. You know, if a child, uh, this is one of the main, you could say, uh, necessities of a child to feel protection, you know, to feel that he's hurt, that he's, he has protection. And um, he didn't receive that from his father. His father did not stand up for him. He just remained silent and allowed this injustice to happen. So the small boy um, was a prince, you know, of course, uh, of Kshatriya na nature and blood, and therefore he was very agitated. You know, he really felt hurt in his honor. Even he was a small child, he really felt uh, you know, this deep pain, and he went crying you know, to his mother and asked her, you know, what should I do? You know? And she, um, you know, was a little bit resignated that she cannot really help him directly. But she said that those great, per the great personalities, you know, who want to attain the highest perfection, they live in the forest. That was the hint that she was giving to him. Not in the expectation that he would leave immediately, but he did. You know? Immediately, he left home, you know, he left home, he went to the forest. And um, uh, the great sage Narada, heard about the news that this young prince, you know, has uh, 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 left the palace and is in the, f in the jungle now. So Narada Muni went and met him and tried to convince him to return home. You know, said, uh, he said, what are you doing here? You're so small. This is a very dangerous place. There are so many um, voracious animals, you know, in this jungle. And um, you are, you know, very tender. You're not used to live in the wilderness. You know, you're you used to have, you know, a nice life in the palace. Um, there is no food here. You know, what do you, what do you want to do here? Go back home. <laughs> and uh, the young uh, Druva um, was so determined um, and had such a, such a strong character that he told Narada Muni. If you can help me, please give me some advice. Otherwise, please don't stand in my way. You know, I have something to accomplish. <laughs> and what he wanted to accomplish was he wanted to gain a greater kingdom than his father. So this was his, you could say, childish conclusion. You know, if my, ch my, if my father cannot protect me, I should have a position that is higher and more powerful than my father. Then I will be in a good position. You know? This was his very simple determination. I want to achieve something higher, uh, more powerful position, a greater kingdom than my father. You know? Then I will show it to him. You know? <laughs> um, that was his you know, mood. So when Narada Muni saw this very strong determination in this young boy, he decided to train him. You know? uh, so he trained him how to survive in the jungle, you know, what herbs he could eat, what um, um, berries he could eat, what roots he could eat, what he can use, you know, to clean the body. Um, and also he taught him, you know, how to worship the Lord in a very simple manner in the forest. Um, this is also a very nice section in the previous chapter where basically it is described that under any circumstances there is a way to perform worship, you know. <coughs> uh, you might have a very big temple with, you know, a nice murti, uh, and so much gold jewelry and uh, silver and so many different items and a lot of ghee and, you know. <laughs> but uh, if you are in the middle of the forest, you can still perform the same quality, you know, just with very simple items, you know. So Narada Muni was describing how you can make a form of the Lord just out of earth, you know, whatever earth you find in the forest, you can make a nice form, you can collect flowers in the forest and pure water, and um, the worship is equally valuable. You know? um, maybe to some extent it is even more sublime. You know? uh, we hear how Lord Krishna um, actually is uh, not in the mood of Aishvarya, he's not in the mood of opulence, but Krishna is in the mood of Madhurya. You know? So one of these, uh, you could say, clear symptoms that Krishna uh, is not in Aishvarya, means he's not so much interested in opulence, is that um, 
every day in the morning, Mother Yashoda dresses Krishna very nicely, you know, in very nice ornaments, very valuable ornaments. <coughs> and then Krishna and his friends go to the forest to um, um, herd you know, the calves, the small cows. And um, one of the first things they do is they pick flowers and they cover all, all the jewelry with flowers. <laughs> because Krishna prefers actually the flowers over the expensive jewelry. <laughs> so, in a very similar way, you can worship the Lord, you can satisfy the Lord um, under any circumstances. And Srila Prabhupada comments further in his purport that this also means that um, in any climate, there might be a different set of flowers, a different set of uh, you know, um, staple foods, um, that you know are available. So according to time, place, and circumstances, uh, we can adjust. Yeah? Um, so for example, in the um, 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 Simhachalesha Suprabhata that we sing here, that uh, um, we play every morning, there it is mentioned that it's a very nice set of uh, shlokas composed specially for this temple. And there it says, you know, um, Triveni Pasau Pure. You know? So in the Triveni, where the three rivers meet in Pasau, this deity is worshipped and he is offered local food like bread. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so an assimilative is offered, you know, German bread, you know, and he accepts it. <laughs> he also gets idli. But uh, if there's no dal, you know, available anymore for some reason. <laughs> If for some reason all the delivery chains collapse, we can offer whatever we have here. Yeah? <laughs> so this is the purport of this, that in any circumstances, wherever you find yourself, according to the local, you know, whatever is locally available, um, one can always worship the Lord, according to place, time and circumstances. Kala, Desha, Patra. So many things are... Uh, many of you could say the regulations and rules that you will find in the Vedic scriptures or in the Puranas are actually um, uh, to be considered according to time, place and circumstances. And then there are some uh, injunctions or some, you could say, very fundamental things that completely transcend Kala, Desha, Patra, also Jati is mentioned, you know, Jati means birth, you know, what kind of birth you have. Um, some, um, some items, they completely transcend those items. So, um, generally, you could say, in the Yoga Sutras, also a very similar statement is made, you know, that the Yamas and Niyamas, they transcend the Kala, Desha, Patra, Jati, and there's a little bit longer list. <coughs> um, so that means that you cannot say, uh, well, in the past this was very important, you know, now it's different time, modern times, we should not, it's not, not so relevant anymore. <laughs> so when, when, an, when a principle is universally applicable, um, it's usually emphasized like that, you know. Um, so for us, for example, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra, you know, or the four regulative principles, you know, which are the uh, yamas that we follow. Um, no intoxication, you know, no meat eating, no gambling, no illicit sex. So these are uh, principles that transcend Kala, Desha, Patra. It doesn't matter if you are in New York or in the jungle in, um, in Brazil, these principles don't change you know, like that. So some principles change according to Kala, Desha, Patra, and some principles are universal and never change. <coughs> So Dhruva Maharaj received, you know, very practical, you know, advice, you know, very specific to his situation, how to survive, you know, as a young uh, ascetic, you know, in the forest. Um, but also he received um, uh, transcendental, you know, eternal um, instruction, uh, a mantra. He received the twelve-syllable mantra. You know? Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So this 12-syllable mantra was the mantra Dhruva Maharaj was initiated uh, upon in, uh, by Narada Muni. And um, the small boy immediately started practicing you know, this form of meditation and simple life. And um, 
within half a year. Yeah? So, according to the Vedas, in different ages, um, different amounts of time are uh, available or also um, traditionally utilized you know, to attain perfection. So, in the Satya Yuga, we hear about yogis meditating for very, very long periods of time, you know, like really, really long, unimaginably long periods of times. But this young boy Prahlad, even he was in the Satya Yuga, he within half a year, you know, <laughs> within half a year, he attained perfection. You know, just within half a year, um, he very um, consecutively um, withdrew his senses more and more and was completely absorbed um, within. So it is described that in the beginning he was you know, living on berries and on fruits, on leaves and roots. You know. Then after you know, some time he stopped eating and he was only drinking. You know. And then after some time, a few weeks later, he stopped drinking and was only sustaining on prana. You know. means only, on, um, only by inhaling and exhaling. Um, and he was practicing uh, also yoga asana. He was standing, you know, in tadasana uh, with one foot, hands upright. And at one point, he even mastered, um, um, after around half a year, he even mastered um, prana and apana. So in the Bhagavad Gita, we hear that the culmination of yoga is when you are able to make the prana, which is the inhalation, the upward moving energy and the apana, the downward moving energy on the exhalation, they become um, so subtle uh, that they merge into each other. You know? They merge into each other and they neutralize each other. So this is the perfection of pranayama, when you have full control of you know, the pranas in the body. And um, he achieved that within half a year. You know? Within half a year he achieved that. And not only that, by the chanting of this mantra, he was able to see antaryami or the, the super soul, you know, paramatma within the heart. Um, and this is basically the, the situation we're, we are hearing right now, that um, he was completely, um, he achieved perfection within half a year. He was seeing the Lord in his heart in meditation and he was controlling the prana so um, it is described to such a level that he became one with the energy of Vishnu, it is described. And he, the whole planet could not breathe anymore. He was, not only his prana was controlled, so then, but the whole prana of the whole world. Because prana and apana is a principle that is occurring everywhere in the world. Everything is breathing, the whole planet is breathing, you know, um, the whole universe is breathing. Um, we hear about Mahavishnu uh, on his um, apana, all the universes are manifested, and on his prana, everything is um, inhaled, you know, back in. So this principle of prana and apana is universal, and he controlled it to such an extent that it extended to all the other living entities you know, of the world. So Lord Vishnu was approached by the devatas, you know, to solve this problem, because they couldn't understand what was happening. And um, Lord Vishnu said, don't worry, I will take care of it. <laughs> so the young boy Prahlad is still meditating in Madhuvan, you know, in Brindavan, in Braj, uh, next to the Yamuna River. And um, he suddenly um, loses that vision of Paramatma within his heart. You know? So the Paramatma, he can see within his heart, it is described, you know, it's more or less like this big. He was seeing this form in the heart, like you're standing in the temple and you see the deity, you know, in a very similar way. Um, it's a very beautiful, you know, form, sitting on a, standing on a lotus, and you take darshan, and suddenly this form disappeared. So he was, you know, uh, he was shaken out of his uh, meditation, and suddenly the same form that he had seen in his heart was standing right in front of him. Yeah. Right in front of him. Yeah. Prishnigarva, very beautiful, with four hands. But something changed suddenly. You know? <clears throat> when he saw the Paramatma in his heart, he was just happy. You know? But when he saw the Lord outside, you know, in front of him, he became very confused. You know? He was agitated, it is described, 
like we also hear here, he was, you know, awkward, he couldn't speak, and how was it described yesterday? I think Advantagantam. Greatly confused. <laughs> he was greatly confused, you know. Um, and this is described um, by different Acharyas and also Shiloh Prabhupada that when when somebody um, is uh, has Brahman rela uh, Brahman realization, um, a big difference is when you see Paramatma directly in the heart. But the biggest difference is when you see suddenly the same personality in front of you. Um, Paramatma, he was completely fine just looking at this Paramatma, taking darshan and being, you know, blessed by this darshan. But when the Lord was standing in front of him, it was a much more complete form. You know, um, according to the Bhagavatam, this would be the complete form. Bra Bhagavan incorporates Paramatma and also includes Brahman. You know, all three are then combined, you know, in one person. Um, but it's a full person. You know, um, so it's very similar. Like if you're standing in front of the altar, and suddenly the murti starts talking to you. You know, <laughs> so that would be a little bit, you know, confusing. You know, <laughs> uh, when the Lord is just standing there, we are very happy to take darshan. But if he starts moving or talking, you know, it's you know, you don't. We are not prepared for this. You know? <laughs> so in a very similar boy way, the small boy Druva was not prepared, you know. Um, also, of course, because it is described he was a young boy, he was inexperienced, and he felt a strong urge, you know, he wanted to glorify the Lord, but he couldn't speak, you know. He couldn't find the right words. Um, and um, and then, of course, this very nice uh, moment happens when the Supreme Lord, Bhagavan, standing right in front of him, being at the same time the super soul in his heart, completely understood his situation, you know, his awkward situation, that he did not know how to act, what to say. Um, and the Lord is described, touched uh, Dhruva's head, Dhruva's forehead, with his shanka. You know. And at that moment, he was empowered, you know, empowered to speak, empowered to um, glorify the Lord. So, in a different area, a section of the Bhagavatam, in the story of Prithu Maharaj, it is described how um, simply by decorating the form of the Lord, the conclusion of the Vedas become realized within the heart. You know? This is, um, and Prabhupada emphasizes this over quite a few purports, how um, powerful it is to worship the murti you know, of the Lord. Um, but the principle is the same. The principle is that ultimately, if we really want to glorify the Lord, we are dependent on His empowerment. You know? um, it is generally said that anybody who can teach uh, successfully uh, must be empowered by Krishna Shakti. You know? If he is not empowered by Krishna Shakti, he will not be able to really speak. You know? um, and um, um, in one sense, indirectly, um, Srila Prabhupada is, you could say, uh, hinting towards um, himself, because we have heard from himself that sometimes Prabhupada was reading his own books, and uh, some one disciple asked him one time, you know, why are you reading your own books, you know? Um, I said, well, I, I wrote it, I, I dictated them, but actually Krishna dictated it to me, you know? So it's very interesting for me also to read. <laughs> Uh, again, you know. so um, we should not underestimate, uh, or you could say also we should be conscious that we are not alone. You know, uh, ultimately the super soul in the heart, Paramatma, is Upadrashtva Numanta. You know, Smritim Gyanam Apohanam Cha. So he is the he gives permission, and from him comes knowledge. You know, um, forgetfulness um, and remembrance. You know? So. Anything that we remember, that we know, it's due to the uh, sanction of the Paramatma. You know? It's not that we are doing it by ourselves. You know? um, and in the Bhagavad Gita, um, even like beyond that point, even like for any action that we perform, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Ahankara vibhmudatma, kartaham itimanyati, that those who are uh, under the influence of Ahankara, 
the false ego, they are pretty sure that they are doing everything they're doing. You know? But in reality, we are not doing anything. You know? <laughs> everything that we are doing, it is performed by the three gunas of material nature. You know? So these three gunas are like the um, fundamental ingredients you know, of this material reality. You know? It's tamaguna, ignorance, darkness, you know, sleep, um, Rajaguna, activity, passion, desires, and Sattvaguna, you know, <coughs> knowledge, enlightenment, elevation, light. Um, so these three gunas um, um, are in combination in all kinds of different shades. You know, just like the three primary colors you can combine into millions of different you know, colors. In a similar way, these three gunas make up everything that we experience. You know. And we think we are acting but in reality it's the gunas. You know? And in the Yoga Sutras it is described that the gunas have the tendency to vie for ascendancy against our interests. You know? So they will basically rise or become prominent against what might be good for us. You know? Or against what we might even have decided to do. You know? um, like for example, you want to drive somewhere, you know, and sometimes if you're very active, I have this experience sometimes when I'm you know, doing so many things and then finally I'm driving somewhere, like a long distance, then after half an hour, I have to stop and I have to sleep. You know? <laughs> so even I want to drive, uh, Tamaguna is more powerful and I have to sleep. You know? <laughs> um, or in a different situation, the opposite you know, can also be there. You, know? you want to sleep, but you're thinking about so many things. You know? You cannot sleep, you know, <laughs> too much Rajaguna, you know, when actually you would like to be, you know, peaceful in Tamaguna. Um, but it doesn't, uh, the, the modes, they act uh, against our interest, against our decisions. So that should be a very clear indication that we are not under control. You know? And when it seems that we are under control, still, you know, um, that's Sattvaguna. Sattvaguna is... Um, discipline, order, sequence, you know, it seems you are, it's under control. And Sattva Guna um, uh, conditions us by the sensation of success, sensation of material happiness, sensation of power, you know. Um, you think you have it all under control, you know. And the next moment, you know, anything can happen, you know. <laughs> uh, we think everything is perfect and fine, you know, and, you know, Anything can happen in this world, you know, at every step there is some, you know, some of the gunas will come up, you know, um, some form of passion or ignorance. Um, generally speaking, if uh, sattva guna is only material, um, it's uh, already mixed with the two other modes. And it's only a question of time until they again, you know, um, passion and ignorance drag you down. You know? So usually somebody who is in sattva guna might be very successful but also very soon will become very proud. You know? And where there is pride, uh, and where you think you're good, you, know, um, you can't get any better. You know? So there is stagnation, then there is complacency, and then again there is you know, tamaguna. You know? <laughs> so like that, we should be very conscious that we are not really uh, in control here. You know? We are actually um, desiring, you know, this is our main reason why we exist, desire. Desire is the source of suffering. Desire is the reason why we are active. Um, but um, technically the Atma is in a slumber within matter. And it's only the consciousness that it's emanating that is invigorating, you know, this material, you know, situation. Um, which doesn't mean that um, um, because that could be the wrong conclusion. If I'm not doing everything, then why am I being held accountable? You know? <laughs> you know, if the gunas are doing everything, then why is it me that has to suffer the consequences of karma? You know? So that's a very good question. Um, and we can understand that um, there is a difference between um, 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 for example, if you're driving a car, you know, um, you are the driver behind this car, but you're not the engine, you know, you're not burning the engine, you know, you're not making all this endeavor to run, you know, uh, you're not transmitting any energy to the wheels, you know, <laughs> you're, 
you're just directing it. You know? So in a very similar way, we are directing this. So you could say, no, it was not me, it was the car. The car was running, the car crashed into this other person. It was not me, you know? <laughs> it was the car. <laughs> but somebody was directing the car. You know? So in a very similar way, we are directing this yantra rudrani maya ya. You know? It's a yantra, it's a machine uh, made out of elements, material elements, material energy. Very complex machine. The most complex machine, according to evolutionists, the crest jewel of the evolution, you know? <laughs> um, of course, we don't believe in you know, evolution theory. We believe in devolution. Um, according to Sankhya Yoga, everything has a subtle origin and then manifests into a gross reality. You know? um, the idea of evolution is that there is a very, um, in, I could say, unevolved, you know, original, um, um, how do you call it, amoeba, some kind of like, you know, invertebrate water creature. <laughs> and from that, little by little, you know, through evolution becomes more and more complex. You know? <laughs> but, huh? Unicellar. Unicellar. Yes. So, but um, according to um, Sankhya philosophy, we actually uh, uh, understand that there is evolution, but the evolution is happening from one life to the next, you know. Each life experience that we have um, is an evolution, or it could also be, especially in the human form, depending how we act, it could also be a degradation. You know? But within the animal kingdom, each animal is progressing from, one to li from life to life. You, know? they are, you could say it's like a video game. You know? Have you ever played video games? There are different levels. You know? <laughs> different you know, levels you can cross, and if you are if you manage this level, you're ready for the next level, you know. And then the next level becomes more complex, you know, more difficulties, more challenges, you know. Um, and uh, if you don't manage, you have to again start the same level until you manage the level. Then you can go to the next level. So in a very similar way, there is evolution of consciousness. You know? um, within the animal kingdom, it's happening, um, you could say, naturally and consecutively, mechanically. Uh, whereas as humans, we have a very unique position where we can uh, exit the samsara cycle. Yeah. So samsara is the cycle of birth and death. You know, where we are, it's a cycle. You know, it's like a big uh, wheel. You can you know go up, up, up. You know, Brahma would be the top position, um, and then you can go down again. You can degrade yourself again. You know? So whenever we are in a position of a human form of life. Uh, of which there are also many different. Um, in human forms of life, we have more responsibility, uh, but also we have more opportunity. You know? So if we use the opportunity, we can elevate ourselves um, you know, very much within matter. We can also transcend matter completely. Or if we indulge in basic, um, the basic animal needs, namely eating, sleeping, mating, defending, if we only use our human intelligence to increase or to sophisticate those four, um, you could say, animal tendencies, then we will be born again as animals. You know? And it's not reincarnation. Sometimes people always misunderstand that reincarnation is some kind of um, Russian roulette, you know, by chance, you know. Uh, like on a ferry, you might, there's this big wheel and you can turn the wheel and Maybe you get one euro or you get you know, the biggest price, you know. <laughs> so it's not like that, you know. It's not that at the end of life, you know, the Paramatma turns the wheel and you're like, worm, oh no, I don't want to be a worm, you know. <laughs> or maybe you will be born as an eagle or, you know. <laughs> it's according to what you want. What we cultivate, whatever you cultivate during your life, um, naturally forms your subtle body. You know, the Akash Chitta, the subconscious, is modeled just like plastiline or ceramic. You know? So, like if you have a ball of ceramic, you know, clay, let's say, um, whatever you do, you know, whatever experience you have is a samskara, it's an imprint into that clay. So you're shaping, in every moment, you're shaping your consciousness. You know? So when you die, um, uh, when we die, when we all die, um, Krishna says in the Gita, that state of consciousness we have at the moment of death, 
decides where we are going. You know? And the consciousness we have at the moment of death is basically a recap of our life. You know? This is described in the Vedas and also many people who have had near-death experiences have this experience that you see your whole life in a very fast uh, backward motion, you know? like, a, like a film. You, know? you re-experience your whole life, fast forward, within a minute or two, you see your whole life again and that is the summary of your consciousness. You know? So that's a very clear form. Whatever was more pre most predominant, you know, if you really like to eat without discrimination, there is plenty of animal bodies that are very good at eating. You know? Very good. You could eat without discrimination, no uh, indigestion problems, you know. You don't need hachmola, you know. <laughs> you can just eat and eat and eat and eat. You know? um, or if you want to kill, you know, if you like to eat blood, you know. Many animals are very powerful, you know. They have very, you could say, powerful jaws, teeth, you know. Leopards, um, or was it leopards? I think leopards, they're very fast. They can run almost 100 kilometers per hour, you know. And they can jump up to 20 meters, you know. And they, one bite, you know, they kill their prey, you know. <laughs> so if you have some desire like that, you know, to be a very powerful killer, you know, there is an animal body for that. For any material desire that is, you know, sort of revolving around eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, there are plenty of animal bodies that are actually ideal to do that. The human body is not ideal to do that at all. You know? We don't have very dangerous nails, you know. If we try to, you know, kill somebody with our nails, it will hurt ourselves, you know. <laughs> um, and our teeth are also not so good, you know. If you want to, you know, bite, uh, uh, you know, through the leather of an animal, you know, you will have some trouble, you know. <laughs> um, and also, we're not very fast, you know. Uh, sleeping also we cannot so good, you know, like usually after 10 hours you just are awake, you know, and if you stay longer you become more tired, you know, you get some pain in the body. But some animal forms like bears or, you know, sloths, they can sleep, you know, a lot. You know, you know the sloth? Sloth is a very nice animal. The sloth, they are they're in the jungle in Brazil, maybe I think in Asia somewhere also, but they, they have very long nails <coughs> and after each movement, maybe after two movements, they take a nap. You know? <laughs> so you will see them like hanging in a tree like this, sleeping usually. And then they'll wake up, they eat one leaf, two leaves, and then they will move their arm like this. And then they take a nap. You know? <laughs> then they move the left leg slowly, you know, on and on, oh, let's sleep again, you know. <laughs> And then they climb up the tree slowly, eating, sleeping, you know, like that. <laughs> so, f if you have this tendency, you know, there is, for every tendency, there is a perfect animal body where it's not degrading or sinful, on the contrary, you know, you, you learn something from that level and you can progress to the next um, level. So, yeah, reincarnation is not um, irrational at all, it's very rational, it's very just. Um, and it's just a reflection of our desires, actually. So, the first sentence in the purport, there's a very interesting point, that would be the last point I would like to make. So, Srila Prabhupada says, Every devotee wants to chant the transcendental qualities of the Lord. Devotees are always interested in hearing about the Lord's transcendental qualities, and they are always eager to glorify these qualities. But... Sometimes they feel inconvenienced by humbleness. <laughs> so um, uh, this remind, reminds me of this lecture from Jayadvaita Maharaj, um, where he said that um, if you're sitting on the Vyasasana, you should not be too humble. You know, <laughs> otherwise, if you excuse yourself, you know, too much at the beginning of the lecture, that you will speak now, you know, and uh, then people might think, might start thinking, maybe he's really unqualified. You know? <laughs> maybe we should not hear from him. So that's a very interesting point that Prabhupada is making here. So we sh sometimes a devotee might feel inconvenienced by humility. You know, if you're very humble, you might feel yourself worthless you know, to glorify the Lord, or maybe you don't feel that you have any capability to actually 
glorify the Lord. And of course, the hint is directly here that, of course, we should have the desire to glorify the Lord. And at the same time, we should, uh, we should take shelter of the Lord, you know, because whatever we will be able to say, it's not, um, uh, it's not our self-speaking, you know. Um, we try to pray to the Lord to be inspired to speak according to Shastra, according to um, the Guru Varga, according to what Krishna um, is trying to say. So, in one sense, um, I remember one time when I was uh, traveling with my Gurudev, one god brother, I forgot exactly the situation, but it was some, we wanted to make some, some dramas we were performing, I think Bhagavad Gita drama, and there was some confusion. And then um, my god brother told me, you're so full of yourself that you don't realize what needs to be done. You know? <laughs> and this was like, I was so full of myself that I didn't really, it took me a while to like digest and like reflect and like, what, what did he just say? What does he mean, you know? <laughs> but if we are so full of ourselves, you know, taken over by our fear, by our maybe, you know, uh, because fear usually, like when you want to speak, maybe you're afraid that you will say something wrong, people will laugh at you, or, you know, when you want to go on stage, of course, you might have some stage fright also, you know? So when you're so full of yourself, you're blocked, you know? You can't do anything, you just like, you know, <laughs> no, not useful, you know. <laughs> so, um, and of course, the the example that we hear very often that also is mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita is that we are trying to become, um, in one sense, like a tool, you know, not like a not 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 like a unconscious tool, but like a willing tool, you know. <laughs> Voluntarily, we want to be a tool. Please, you know, I want to be used, I want to be useful, you know, I want to be empowered, and to be empowered, we have to be free of ourselves, you know. Um, sometimes, uh, when the anarthas are described, so anartha means all kinds of qualities that are negative, you know, that we carry within ourselves, and um, one way Srila Prabhupada describes anarthas is that uh, it's a form of death, you know, we have to let go of this anartas. You know, we hear about it in the third canto, how Brahma also sometimes got too much, too full of himself, confused by passion, and he had the ability to actually discard this body. So this body became like contaminated. You know, um, it's like when you have some cloth, maybe you, you know, you spill something, so you get rid of this cloth, you put new clothes. Brahma was able to do that. You know, he actually. This body he had developed some desire, became so full of himself, so he discarded this body completely. You know, so um, anartha to get rid of anarthas is like dying. You know? So it means it it is painful. You know? <laughs> it will be painful. You know? It is not so easy, but um, if we manage to become, you know, um, free of this, you know, ahankara, not this because it's the wrong self, it's not the true self. Um, then we become, um, um, then we can become empowered. You know? Empowered one can come. So we have to be a little bit detached. We have to be, um, you know, um, because humility. There's not example of this. Is like when um, when devotees are performing devotional service. Um, the nature of you know of you know advanced devotional service is that you will feel ecstasy. You know? You might feel some ecstatic symptoms like crying or, you know, choking of the voice, like Prahlad also. He is, you know, inconvenienced. <laughs> um, and this, in this, this, you could say, advanced symptoms of devotional service uh, also can become um, uh, an obstacle. You know? So we hear, for example, about um, Uddhava, um, who was fanning Krishna in Dwarka, and he was so much absorbed in love for Krishna, that he was crying, you know, and he was getting, you know, it was, his ecstasy was disturbing for him, you know, so he wanted to stop it because he couldn't see Krishna properly anymore, and he was getting distracted from his seva, you know? <laughs> so like that, it could be like, you know, from a material point of view that we are too full of anarthas that we can't really, you know, act, but in a very advanced level, like Dhruva Maharaj also here, somebody was achieved such a high um, position, 
we uh, might be inconvenienced by the results of our you know, um, bhakti uh, or by our humility. And we should pray to the Lord to be empowered to again be, you could say, useful or able to um, be active in his service. Hare Krishna. Maybe there is some question or comment. Yes, Munindra Gana was first. Gibt es das zweite Mikro nicht? Aber kann man nicht die, ähm, die Kopfhörer-Dinger machen? Aber ich kann es auch wiederholen. Mhm. Mhm. Um, I know that Srila Prabhupada somewhere says that uh, and a little bit later um, we hear how Dhruva Maharaj um, even he attained this you know, perfection directly got darshan of Vishnu. Um, Vishnu told him now you have to govern the planets you know, for 27,000 years. You know? And he was like no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, I just want to be with you. you know? And there this Prabhupada describes that no, he's a Mishra, Mishra Bhakta. There was some, this, the original motivation was to attain power, you know, to attain this. So this had to be fulfilled. So therefore we should be careful what we desire, you know, also in Krishna consciousness. Generally what you desire, because any desire that you cultivate, eventually it will be manifested. And I've experienced in my own life that sometimes when, it, when it's manifested, sometimes much later, then you like, I don't want it anymore, <laughs> but you desired it, now the delivery is there. Like I read this very funny uh, uh, um, uh, survey that actually on weekends there's a lot like the, the, the orders on Amazon and on all like online platforms rise very much on weekends, um, but not necessarily voluntarily. You know? Many people, you know, they are completely drunk and they have their phone in their hand and they start ordering stuff. Oh, look at this. Oh, look at this, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, Wednesday or maybe Monday already, if they have Amazon Prime, suddenly, you know, you have this big plastic uh, inflatable duck, you know. It's like, I didn't order this. And this is like, then you look in your phone. Oh, I did order yesterday night when I was drunk. <laughs> and it's a real statistic, you know, that so many people, when they're drunk, they order all kinds of things they don't really want it to order, but they did order. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar with desires. You know, sometimes when we are confused, um, you know, or conditioned in different ways, we might have something very strong desires, you know. So we should be always questioning, you know, the strong desires that we cultivate. Because the, the order will be fulfilled. And at one point it comes back and then we don't want it. So Dhruva Maharaj didn't want anymore to be a king. You know, but he had to fulfill this duty. You know, and um, later on there is this very famous situation where he actually he was um, um, taking revenge you know, to the Yakshas. You know? So he actually went on a campaign, a military campaign against the Yakshas. You know? And huge battle, in, and, and he was so powerful, and he was managing to, you know, to destroy all the yakshas. And um, he, you know, at one point he was almost overcome by illusion of the yakshas, and he took shelter of Narayan Kavacha, and then he again managed to, you know. So he was always taking shelter of Vishnu, but at the same time he had this, you know, he was so enraged that Brahma himself had to come and say, okay, it's enough, you know. <laughs> You know, so like that. So Dhruva Maharaj was certainly an advanced devotee, but it was there was some Mishra that had to be purified still. But it is described after he after that period where he was reigning, he of course um, uh, went on to occupy um, the pole star. It's considered that Dhruva Dhruva Loka is the pole star. So that's the fixed star that is fixed in the sky upon which everything revolves. Now in the north, so in the night, if you look in this direction, in the north, there is one fixed star. It's called the pole star or Dhruva Loka for us. And Dhruva Maharaj is residing on the pole star. And the Dhruva Loka is considered to be 
uh, a Vaikuntha planet within matter. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? <coughs> Having taste. taste mm -hmm. um, I mean, association, of course. Association is. Um, and um, it is important, like, ultimately, like, when you ask a, such a question, it's which is, you know, you could always cook it down to sincerity. You know, the more sincere we are, um, the more there will be reciprocation also. And. Um, Sincerity is uh, sometimes very straightforward, you know, if you are, you have a very simple, sincere desire to do something for Krishna. Um, but uh, the more it comes from the head, it becomes complicated, you know. It's like, I want to be sincere. Yeah, why do you want to be sincere? Well, I want to be sincere because I want to advance in Krishna consciousness. But why do you want to advance in Krishna consciousness? Ah, because I want to get finally initiated. Uh, no, 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 I, I want to, <laughs> you know, so if the more it comes from the head, you know, it's, um, you could say, tinged, you know, with some jnana, you know. So bhakti has to be free of jnana, free of karma, you know, that's the definition of bhakti. Um, but of course we will be mixed to some extent. Um, and we can be happy if we have, you know, a natural inclination, you know, to serve the Lord. Um, the more it comes like a natural desire, it's, you know, very easy. The, the more it becomes from the head or from some material desire, um, we should always be um, cautious, you know, to really understand what is motivating us. You know? um, yeah, to really cultivate um, sincerity is very important. Um, and I, I'm reminded of this lecture Jai Sachinanam Prabhu gave about the spiritual master. You know, there's so many different ways you can, you know, try to find a spiritual master or decide who your spiritual master is. You can be very pragmatic and say, okay, this person is coming regularly. Nice. <laughs> uh, or at the end, what just actually was like emphasizing, well, you have to pray. You know, you have to pray. You know. So this was also the recommendation of Gorgovinda Maharaj. You have to really pray sincerely, and according to the sincerity that you master within, uh, the Chaiti Guru will manifest outside as well, you know. So, um, ultimately everything cooks down to our sincerity. And do we really want it, you know, and why do we want it, you know, if you want it. Okay, anything else? Yes, Prabhu. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering that uh, does this happen only in the, uh, in the devotee stage, pure devotee stage, mm. or this also happens in the sadhaka stage, or uh, sometimes we say that without the sanction of Lord, not even the blade of grass moves. Mm -hmm. So when in the sadhaka stage somebody speaks or writes uh, something, uh, does, it, does this also come as a dictation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. It's a little bit tricky because, of course, um, a neophyte devotee um, will have, especially a neophyte devotee has the tendency to think that, you know. Um, so a neophyte devotee thinks, you know, uh, I'm very close with Krishna already and um, I have understood and therefore people actually should do what I'm saying. You know? <laughs> so... Um, so there, of course, it is uh, easy to understand that somebody like that, um, you know, is, you know, is motivated by some material, you know, a desire to, you know, misuse very often even the, you know, the words of Shastra to control or to dictate, you know, something. But um, um, 
the 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 way I understood it is what I also mentioned. I don't know the verse, unfortunately, but there is this verse where the word Krishna Shakti is directly mentioned. That anybody who is able to inspire somebody, you know, um, um, basically where you know something is happening in the other person's heart, um, that is um, you know Krishna Shakti. You cannot inspire somebody or give Krishna to somebody if you don't have Krishna yourself, you know. And um, um, of course, ideally, we have an Uttamadikari, you know, pure devotee, who's doing that, you know, always, you know, without interruption. But clearly, it is that any devotee, you know, in any stage, might be empowered, you know, for some time or in a certain situation, to um, to do that. You know. um, because the, uh, in connection to Kirtan, it is also described. Um, I once heard this description from uh, my Gurudev that um, the Kanishta Kirtan is, you know, you do by yourself Kirtan, or, you know, you can do by yourself, but not really many people will appreciate, you know, <laughs> um, your Kirtan, you know, you're just by yourself, more or less. Um, if you're a little bit more advanced, you will manage to inspire the devotees, you know, so the devotees will be inspired by your Kirtan. You know. And if you're really advanced, an Uttamadikari, then when you chant, the masses of the people, you know, anybody, even they're not devotees, they will appreciate and they will, they will have uh, an inspiration to become devotees, to, to chant and to sing along. So, um, like that. So there is certainly a, you know, a, a difference of the effect that we have. And I would, use the, you could measure in the effect it has, you know. Somebody might talk about Krishna like um, Srila Prabhupada very often criticized um, this uh, Bhagavad Shaptata, you know, that so seven days Bhagavatam, uh, where it becomes a show, you know. And I remember who's, some devotee mentioned that he was in India and there was this big, you know, Bhagavad Shaptata and so many thousands of people gathered, big pandal, and this uh, the speaker behind the, the stage, he was putting some chili in his eyes, you know. So he could make a good show, you know, that he's crying. <laughs> so that, of course, you know, it's not probably not dictated by Krishna. There's some <laughs> so, but um, yeah, it's sometimes difficult to 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 realize, you know, what is the real um, what's the real deal, you know, because maybe all these people are are very very inspired, you know, and they're also crying. <laughs> But it might all be in the emotional, you know, it's very just an emotional show and not really. Um. On the other hand, it is also said that the, um, the cheating guru is like Putana. You know? So Putana, uh, the witch Putana, she tried to, um, Putana, she tried to poison Krishna with her breasts. You know? So she pretended to be a loving mother, you know. And the Brajavasis, they thought she's the goddess of fortune, you know. She was so beautiful, so they allowed her to enter uh, into the chamber of uh, Krishna. And she took baby Krishna. And Krishna sucked her life air, you know, all her prana. So Krishna killed her materially. But um, it is described that Krishna, after she killed her the demonic body, gave her the position of a mother in Goloka Vrindavan. So this is described that this is like the cheating guru. The cheating guru might be cheating, you know, but still he has a benefit, you know. <laughs> so he will have to die, he will have to, you know, suffer his consequences, but it still has a benefit. It still has a benefit for the guru and even for the people. So um, that is also described, that Krishna actually accepted that offering, even if it was you know, not a not not an honest offering, but it was nicely presented. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so Krishna said, "Okay, you know, you're my mother." You know, so Krishna accepted Putan as one of his mothers in the spiritual world. So similarly, we might be in a position where we are not very honest, you know, or not fully like I say in intega. So you say intega of Dutch, um, huh? We say one intega of English. Yeah, with not, with not with not full integrity, you know, we might want to, but we are we have some weaknesses, so there's still a benefit, you know. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Yes. Uh, you, you talked about evolution and devolution. 
Yes. So, in evolution, it is, it has been said that uh, uh, various different species, they got evolved. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, the first point is that the, according to the Vedas, there is 8,400,000 different species of life. And um, once I was reading this uh, Geo magazine, and they were uh, talking about the scientists in different jungles and different areas of the world, they're counting the species. And they had counted, I think, 2 million species or something like that, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And they, in this article, they were talking about different estimates, you know, how much there must be, because they realized that many species they discover after they have been extinguished, you know, and they know that many species they will never discover because they're extinguished because they're before they can be discovered. And then they were talking about you know different concepts that maybe the species are manifest, you know, for some time then they're unmanifest and then they manifest again, because this also happens that you know regularly. If you follow a little bit this, there's some species that was 100% extinguished, then 100 years later, somewhere suddenly it's there again, you know. <laughs> um, it happens, you know. So, and then they actually quoted Srila Prabhupada in this article. You know, the Bhaktivedanta Swami, um, citing the Vedic tradition, says that they're, according to the Vedas, there are 8,400,000 species. And many of the estimates that they calculated were actually similar numbers. Some were estimating 12 million, some. 8 million or 9 million. Um, and um, in, the, in this description that we have is that it's also divided, you know. So there's, uh, I forgot exactly the numbers, but I think 900,000 aquatics, 1.1 million insects, you know, like, so it's, it's subdivided also into its subsections. And um, the idea is that these are the set of species that are available. And they might be manifest or unmanifest at different times, you know. Uh, they might not be all visible right now on planet Earth, but for sure these species exist throughout the universe. Um, they are all manifested, you know, to some level. Um, and um, how the, how everything is manifested? It the the um, creation is described in the Bhagavatam quite a few times. And the basic idea is that everything starts, this is the idea of the evolution or Sankhya Yoga, everything starts from a subtle source, and from a subtle source it becomes more and more manifest. So, um, yeah, according to the Vedas, Brahma is the Prajapati, and he is the one in charge in populating the universe, you know, with human species, but also with animal species. Different Prajapatis actually manifest different animal species, it's described in the Bhagavad. In the third canto, there's one specific description, you know, of how the different species manifest from the Prajapatis, actually. Um, yes, so it's a little bit difficult maybe to believe, you know, that somebody can manifest, you know, <laughs> different animal, animal forms. But uh, that's the idea. The idea is that um, a subtle source can manifest uh, gross matter. So that's Always the idea. Yeah, it's a good question. There is a section, but I, I wouldn't remember the detail to be honest. But Sanjay. Yeah. Yeah, the Prajapatis. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, the quite but your, your question I couldn't but it's the third canto. In the third canto, there is this description, and the, you, you question if it's the sequence, you know, which sequence that uh, I wouldn't know by by heart. Sanjay. Mm-hmm. 
So like you, you, like you can inspire the whatever you have accomplished. You know? So you know, says what you can only give what you already have. Yeah. Nice. Anything else? Then thank you very much. Grantaraj Shrimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Shri Prabhu Pad ki jai.